let me know whenever you go live. I have okay. gone. I have gone live. Yeah. I've been on for thirty seconds now. You can go live now. I am. Uh, yeah. I am live. I'm sorry. I'm... Yeah, it says I'm live. I have been live for one minute twenty nine seconds. All right. So just start off with a hello and a brief uh, thing about the. Uh... Okay. Well, thank you very much to Ajay and to Shubra and to Aditi for inviting me to talk to you today. My name is Jane Gibson, and I'm the coordinator of the Durham World Heritage Site. Um, apologies for my eccentric location. I'm between lectures, so I'm sitting outside the common room. Um, uh, from Go UNESCO asked me to look at some questions to talk to you about today. Um, and the first one was, why is heritage site management so important? If I look away from the camera, that's because I've had to have a hard think about this and I've put some notes together. So I think it was important, first of all, to agree why heritage is important. Um, and I went back to the World Heritage Convention there. Um, it told me that the cultural and natural heritage is amongst the priceless and irreplaceable assets, not only of each nation, but of humanity as a whole. The loss through deterioration or disappearance of any of these most prized assets constitutes an impoverishment of the heritage of all of the peoples of the world. So parts of that heritage, because of their exceptional qualities, can be considered of outstanding universal value. And we're really lucky here in Durham to be one of those sites, and as such worthy of special protection against the dangers which increasingly threaten them. So I'm biased, I'm already bought into why um, heritage is important, but I think that really articulates it very well, that it's important to those of us who are turned on to it, but it's of value to everybody, it enriches their lives. Um, protection and management of World Heritage properties ensures that that outstanding universal value is maintained and enhanced, and very importantly here, for present and future generations. And so that's a vital thing about management. We are only temporary custodians. We're actually just looking after it for the next generations to come, our descendants. And if we don't manage the sites properly and preserve that, they won't be inheriting it in the beautiful state that we've got um, the site. We have no right to say that people wouldn't do that. Now, I think that um, heritage is of increasing significance um, to each and all, all societies today, perhaps because of increasing rates of change in society, uh, increasing globalization. And because of that, um, the need for management is even more important. The environment in which our sites sit is increasingly changing. Um, and there was a very nice little graphic that I picked up from um, the Managing World Heritage UNESCO guidelines. My sophisticated um, visual aid here, but you will be able to see that afterwards. Uh, let me see if I can get that up there. Um, is a very good little graphic which talks about all the different things that are impacting on us today. So we have visitors, increasing visitor numbers. Here in Durham, we had over 800,000 last year. We're heading towards a million visitors a year. We also have climate change, you know, something that's absolutely vital. We're seeing increasing numbers of storms here in Durham, so that's affecting us. Other more low-lying sites, sadly, are seeing the challenges of flooding. 
uh, the need for development. That's a continuing factor that's happening here in and around Durham. We're already always, for the last thousand years, life has been changing, so new things have been happening. Resource constraints, um, we're going through an economic downturn here. Money for heritage has always been a challenge. We've now got to make less money go further. So that's something that's coming on. But the wonderful opportunities as well are increasing global community, uh, new opportunities to interact with people and share our heritage. Um, those challenges we've got there. So we've got some challenging things to do. Um, evidence of past societies can give us all a sense of belonging, a place today, a wider perspective and insight into other people, um, both regionally and globally. And of course, understanding the past, I confidently believe, can help us to manage problems of today and the future. History has something to tell us. That ever-increasing rate of change in our lives ensures that our heritage sites are being exposed to pre-existing threats and challenges, new threats, and at an increasing pace. But not to forget that those challenges aren't just threats, they're also opportunities for us. I'm a glass half full person. I see those opportunities being wonderful. Effective site management is vital to ensure that we can hand these precious assets on to our descendants in as good or better state than that in which we inherited them from our ancestors. So that really was my uh, dash through the first question that I was asked to look at in this introduction. Um, I'll now go on to the second one, which is to ask me to talk about a particular best practice or success story related to my heritage site management experience. I've been working in Durham now for three years, and the first things I was working on was our new World Heritage Site Management Plan. And I'm very pleased to be able to show you um, the finished product, which was released in September, just last month. And in that, I have what is actually a management system. And that's something UNESCO have asked us increasingly to look at these days, not just a plan, a do this, do this, do this, but to give people a toolkit that will guide them into best practice. Then we have an action plan of the day-to-day -day things we do. So actually, um, I was having a look um, at that plan and my experiences over the last three years of what our aspirations are as to best practice to maintain our site. Um, World Heritage Sites don't sit in isolation for their from their surroundings. For a living World Heritage Site like Durham, we are at the center of a busy 21st century city um, and both on the World Heritage Site and around it, people go about their daily lives. Things have been changing and developing here for over a thousand years. Since those first monks arrived on the site, carrying the coffin of St. Cuthbert, put it down and started building the biggest stone building people had seen here since the Romans had left several hundred years before. So. We have new developments on and around our boundary, and we have to consider from time to time the potentials for negative impact and the ways to mitigate that impact. We work closely with developers, and in best practice, we're always aspiring to actually have them think about the needs of the World Heritage Site when they're actually doing that development. Quite often, I only find out about new developments after they put in their final plans. But in the last few months, the developers of a major new retail center on the borders of the World Heritage Site came to me to talk about our outstanding universal value, to discuss potentials for impact on the World Heritage Site of their proposed designs, and took into account those requirements when they made their designs so that we'd had that conversation before they put in their application for planning. And I was able to support it because what they had done was sympathetic to the World Heritage Site. So that's the ideal, is to have those discussions right up front, early on in development proposals, not late on when all the decisions have been made and changes are having to be made retrospectively. So that was something I was really pleased about and something I'm hoping will become more common. Um, we also, the third question that I was asked in the introduction, 
was what's the role of people in preserving their heritage and what are the three ways in which they can involve themselves more actively in this process. Um, and again, you know, it was really good for me doing this conference. It's made me go back and think for principles. I went back to um, the World Heritage Convention and it actually says it's the priceless and cultural heritage is the prime irreplaceable assets, not only of each nation, but of humanity as a whole. So we could say perhaps it belongs to all of us, but that belonging is actually, we are only its custodians for our time on this earth. We have no right to change, damage or destroy it. Our duty and responsibility is to hand it on to future generations in at the very least the same state or better than that in which we received it. So um, I had to think about that. And our thought, our, I, my feeling is our first role is to buy into that principle, to understand why it's important to preserve heritage. And that's where my role comes in, to share that understanding and appreciation um, of these magnificent assets and their value to society. So uh, w uh, what I would ask of people is a willingness to learn and be inspired, and I'll do my very best to develop that, to um, infuse people. Also, once people have that, those insights and that value of our heritage, to act as ambassadors, to share that love of heritage with other people, um, to, be, um, to multiply that benefit. And we do a lot of that in Durham through the activities we do on site on a daily basis, welcoming groups of school children in. Only today I've been talking to some students who are doing a course in postgraduate course in cultural heritage management talking to them about the real life experiences and challenges of managing a heritage site, a living heritage site on the ground. And then actually asking people to take up offers to be actively involved in the management process, to take part in consultations. When we did our management plan, we had a public consultation process. When the draft plan was put out online, I went out and did talks to interested groups. We had um, drop-in sessions at the local libraries when people could come and ask me about things in the plan. We asked them, we had over 500 um, contributions back to help us make our management plan better and more relevant to the people who are going to live and use it. So asking people to join in consultations, to volunteer, we have a fantastic pool of volunteers without whom we couldn't, we could do, we couldn't do the events we do on site, um, introducing people to heritage, supporting our events and activities, and very important, giving active and honest feedback to us, telling us where we're getting things right, telling us where we could do them better and working with us. So I think that um, Ajay and Aditi were my answers to your first three questions. I think now you've got some questions from the World Her UNESCO, Go UNESCO interns that I could also talk about. Yes, Jane, give us just one second. We'll be, one of our interns will be posting their questions in mm -hmm. about now. James, so the first question is by Lick Santa Sakaya Anita Chirwa from Malawi, Malawi, Africa. And his question is How do you foster cultural authenticity along with tangible heritage in the communities? 
Excellent. Um, first, I'd like to say another thank you to the wonderful Go UNESCO interns for their questions, because again, they really made me sit down and think uh, about the principles that I perhaps take for granted sometimes. I can tell you I spent a bit of time yesterday going back to some of my references and reflecting on my experiences. And of course, uh, Alex's question is very relevant because um, it's become impo increasingly important for us on World Heritage Sites. Looking back to our original inscription in 1986, our outstanding universal value was very much based on our tangible heritage. Um, if you go back and you see our inscription, you'll see Norman to Gothic architecture, flying buttresses, Motton Bailey castles. But when you see our updated outstanding universal value in 2013, it reflects the evolution of understanding and insight into heritage values and the increasing importance of intangible heritage in the World Heritage Convention and in our understandings of heritage as, as a whole. And in fact, speaking as someone who trained as an archaeologist, that resonates with me. I didn't just work as an archaeologist to find tangible artifacts, but to use them to tell me the stories of how people lived and breathed and existed and enjoyed the places and existed in the places. So now that intangible heritage stands on an equal base of importance in our statement of outstanding universal value. It's an integral part of our heritage value that people have lived and worshipped, learnt and made music, created art, met for events and come to wonder at our site in Durham for over a thousand years and continue to do so today and it is at the core of our key stakeholders missions that this will con they will continue to do all of these things in the future so we're really lucky here that we're in a living world heritage site um, that people are still doing what they have done for the past thousand years on and around our site, albeit in different and evolving ways. And this is the final point is very important in Alex's question. Things will evolve, they will develop and change as they've done so for the past thousand years. And that is actually an integral part of making us what we are today. So for me, I'm actually very lucky as a living world heritage site because that cultural authenticity is happening all around me on the World Heritage Site and in that tangible heritage on a day-to-day -day basis. The important thing for me is to balance that and make sure that we support it and that the historical heritage environment continues to be the host for that. So in some ways, as a living World Heritage Site, that cultural authenticity is embedded into what we do. I can see it could be a challenge in some other sites where perhaps that there is a separation between the cultural authenticity and the tangible heritage site. But it, we're very lucky here in Durham. That's what makes it so exciting. Um, just uh, coming up in November, we will have a major Lumiere Festival, which has already only been going for eight years, but has embedded it in our cultural traditions on the site. All right, Jane, that was lovely. Um, thanks so much. So the next question is from one of our interns, Jambo Sande. He's also from Malawi. And uh, this question is in two parts. The first part goes this way. Which challenges do you face while promoting cultural and natural heritage and their conservation? How do you overcome these challenges? And the second part is more about outreach what do you look for before collaborating with other organizations, such as um, if the methods such as partnerships, if you're doing MOUs or MOCs, etc. So I'll just repeat the question one more time. Which challenges do you face? What challenges do you face while promoting cultural and natural heritage and its conservation? How do you overcome these challenges? The second part is what do you look for before collaborating with other organizations in manners such as partnerships, MOUs, etc. Excellent. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Jambo, for those two questions. Again, really good ones to actually think about, and make one reflect about one's own attitudes and the people that we uh, interact with. 
Um, and it is interesting because, of course, I'm the first to admit that I'm biased. You know, I'm turned on by heritage. I've been an archaeologist for over 35 years. Um, it excites me. It's, I do it in my leisure time as well as at work. I'm very lucky. But I realize not everyone is like that, uh, or at least not to the same extent. Um, so part of um, the challenge for me is um, we can have uh, a, a challenge of a lack of understanding and insight, but we can do so many ways to share our enthusiasm and our insight with people. We can increase understanding through uh, explaining to people. For example, here at Durham, we have an annual World Heritage Lecture Series. Um, and this uh, year's theme has actually been Heritage at Risk. So we've actually been able to spend, we've had six visiting lecturers come in for evening lectures, public free lectures, to um, talk about um, heritage conservation. Um, we've had 40 to 60 people come every other month to hear insights. And those have gone from the macro, the worldwide challenges, when we've heard about um, the Blue Shield program. Um, we're very lucky that Professor Peter Stone at Newcastle University is just a few miles down the road, and he's the UNESCO chair in working on protecting cultural heritage in um, areas of conflict. Came to talk about that. We also had a premiere showing of um, a film um, about uh, the destruction of heritage in Syria, um, but putting it in a long-term perspective. We then um, most recently returned to the micro, the regional challenges, with our historic England advisor talking about the uh, British Heritage at Risk program, which is very topical because it's just been updated in the last couple of months, and we have some heritage um, sites here in the north of England which have just arrived on the Heritage at Risk um, program. I'm very pleased to say none in Durham, so that helped me. But that was great fun. But I'll even admit there, we were preaching what we call in our um, sayings, preaching to the converted. Those people are coming along because they already want to know about heritage. So we also actively engage with people and ask for their insights uh, in other ways. For example, up on Palace Green this week, We've had a wonderful science festival for young people. It's Science Week, so we've had a big tent up on the up on Palace Green, um, full of activities, and it's half term holiday for the school children, and so they've been coming up to the site to learn about um, science. But in that tent, we've also been talking about heritage conservation and how the scientists have been helping us to look after our monuments to preserve them, to maintain them. So we had our um, stonemasons up there talking about lime mortar and how to maintain that. So that's something else we do. We sneak the heritage learning in under other ways, um, and hopefully they learn about it. But we also find, you know, there are people who feel that heritage isn't for them. So I think it's under, important to understand what is important to other people and then share and develop enthusiasm and commitment, looking for common goals and themes and interests. So Durham, for example, is a cultural heritage site. We major on human heritage, but we sit in a beautifully natural river gorge and a meander full of natural history. We welcome people who come in for walks to learn about that. And while we're telling them about the beautiful natural environment in which we sit, we can also talk about the human heritage, which has come there and the natural environment that brought us here. The fact that that beautiful river bend made a natural fortified site for the monks to first set up their new monastery over a thousand years ago. And then again, we have some common base things that are challenges for all of us in conservation. We can all understand the negative impacts of climate change on all aspects of our life and work together to mitigate and improve so many aspects of our life, um, challenging and addressing that climate change, finding ways to work around it, of which heritage, the challenges to heritage, is just one small part. There are, of course, major issues there. So there are the ways of talking to people who are already interested by it, increasing their knowledge and insight, widening their knowledge, seeing the wider areas of challenge, but also the sneaky ways of finding back ways in to, in to interest people in heritage, get to what interests them and slip the heritage in. I'm not averse to that as well. And then the second question 
that we had from Jambo, which was about what do I look for before collaborating with other organizations. <laughs> well, partly, I'm very lucky anyway, because the Durham World Heritage Site is a partnership organization. It isn't one single entity that runs it. It's a partnership between Durham University, Durham Cathedral, Durham County Council, St. John's College, and then some other advisors, Durham City Trust, Historic England, and ICOMOS. So already, just by nature, we have a memorandum of understanding between those three partners to work together to maintain and support and celebrate and gain best benefit from being part of a World Heritage Site. And indeed, I'm actually employed by that three key partnership the three partnership of the university, the cathedral and the county council fund my post as coordinator and provide the support to maintain that. So collaboration is built into our DNA from the start. But actually, of course, we are always building new partnerships and we're always looking for common ground and interests. So, for example, with the Science Festival, looking at engaging young people in new, exciting ways to see their world and hosting that on the site. And so important, really, right at the beginning is listening to each other, finding out what our different stakeholder interests are, anticipating, and then finding ways of places that we have um, interests in common, and then also being aware and open to places where we may have conflicts of interest and finding workarounds that. When you're working in a partnership, there will always be needs to compromise, to find common interests, to find ways of supporting each other. So engendering an atmosphere of mutual respect and support is vitally important. Listening, being open to other people's points of view, finding ways to work together and collaborate. I think those are the things that have been very important to me in setting up our collaborations with other organizations. Cool, um, lovely answer. Thanks, Jane. The next question is by our intern from Kenya, Leela Yusa, and she has a two-part question as well. The first part is, what are the opportunities for community involvement on World Heritage Site management with emphasis on youth. Do you know of any success stories from Africa or in particular from Kenya? Mm -hmm. The second part is what is the future of World Heritage with respect to infrastructure development versus conservation? These two opposing forces, what is the future of World Heritage and in respect of rising conflicts like in terms of heritage, in terms of conflict themselves. The first part is, what are the opportunities for community involvement on World Heritage Site Management with an emphasis on youth? And if there are any success stories that you know in Africa or in Kenya. The second is, what is the future of World Heritage and with rising conflicts, both in terms of conflict as in wars, etc., and in terms of opposing uh, emphasis on infrastructure development versus conservation. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you very much, Leila. Very relevant questions. Um, your first question, particularly with that emphasis on youth, because of course we know in the World Heritage Convention, we are just custodians of world heritage for ourselves in the present, but for people in the future. So the young people that we work with are vitally important because they will be the next generation taking on our wonderful heritage and part of our important thing is to make sure that we give it to them in as good a condition as possible and we equip them with the tools and the ways forward to continue that vitally important responsibility that we hold. I'm very lucky because, of course, Durham University are one of our key stakeholders here. I'm actually sitting in the Department of Engineering at, the very, at this very moment looking at a wonderful model of a Formula One racing car across the way that some of our students have been working on. With Durham University as one of our key stakeholders, I'm surrounded by very enthusiastic, committed, and highly engaged young people. We have several postgraduate courses here at Durham directly linked to our site working with heritage. We have a, a postgraduate course in international cultural heritage management, another one in museum studies. And today, this morning, just before I came and joined you, I was actually talking to the postgraduates looking at cultural heritage interpretation. So 
that immediately gives me a way into talking to this fantastic reservoir and working with this fantastic reservoir of young skills, experience and enthusiasm. And our neighbouring Newcastle University as well has the uh, International Cultural Heritage Studies uh, Department. We do a lot of work, students come and do placements with us every year and most years between particularly Durham University and Newcastle um, over the placement period we would normally have 15 or 20 students doing placements on the World Heritage Site so immediately we're getting that um, experience, they're working with us getting experience but we're having the fantastic opportunity of them doing projects for, for us. For example, last year, uh, Gloria, one of our students, created a special photographic competition with young people, What Makes Durham World Heritage Site Great, which produced some wonderful insights from young people of hidden things that I wouldn't have even seen that made me see Durham World Heritage Site in a different, um, different view. We also have employment and volunteering opportunities. Many of our students work as volunteers at the cathedral, um, helping with the castle on guided tours, and at our World Heritage Site Visitor Center um, as meeters and greeters telling people about Durham World Heritage Site. And sometimes when we're really lucky, some employment opportunities as well. We also have two pre-university groups, Durham Cathedral Young Curators and the Heritage, ah, I'll try saying that, Heritage Lottery Funded Young Heritage Ambassador Program, which was hosted by, by Blan Avon World Heritage Site here. And these youngsters meet regularly on the site and use the World Heritage Site as an inspiration for creative activities. They often host events such as at World Heritage Day, they produced activities for visitors to do on the site, colouring, um, site um, activities. They did special heritage open day guided tours last year when they gave a young person's view of the World Heritage Site. Again, it was great. I went on one because they saw very different things from I did that were interesting and quirky. They're putting on an exhibition in our World Heritage Site Visitor Centre in, no, in, in February next year. Over the winter, they're going to do a photographic inter interpretation of the site, some new things again. They uh, also give guided tours and they come and visit us. And we get visits from other Young Heritage Ambassador groups as well, so they benefit from learning from each other. And then also Durham Castle, which is one of the hearts of our World Heritage Site, houses the oldest college of Durham University. And they have a Castle Community Action Group and one of their particular programs is to engage with young people from our surrounding city and the surrounding countryside to bring them to the World Heritage Site and in particular to experience what it's like to be at a college at Durham University. So perhaps breaking down some of those preconceptions that young people may have, perhaps Durham isn't for them or university isn't for them, getting them a chance to come in and see it's a place they can make what they want of. So we're really lucky that we have a lot of ways in that young people can engage. I am sorry, Leila, I don't have any particular experiences from Africa and Kenya, but I will ask some of our international cultural heritage students, and if I find some, I'll post those through Go UNESCO. They come from all over the world, so they may have a wider perspective. Um, but I'll move on to the second part of your question, which is what is the future of world heritage? Um, infrastructure and development versus conservation, particularly in this period in heritage in times of conflict. Now, I had a challenge. I'm not sure, you know, this is a big question. But I've been very lucky in that our most recent lecture series has been on heritage at risk. And we had the privilege of hearing some, from some very experienced colleagues who had insight and first-hand experience into the challenges far beyond anything we've experienced here in Durham. Of, of being in an active conflict zone. We were particularly lucky to hear from Professor Peter Stone, who's the UNESCO Chair in Cultural Property Protection and Peace, and is based in our neighboring University of Newcastle. And part of the key aims of that program are to reduce prejudice and foster mutual understanding through intercultural engagement. We heard how Peter works firsthand with the military to take the protection of cultural property during conflict seriously. We know that heritage terrorism is now 
um, a fact of life that as an archaeologist I has known be, I, I know has been there for millennia we now see it in real time experience so he's actually going out to military front line battalions and talking to them about the importance of protecting cultural heritage and ways to do that and ways to save it in in times of conflict and also using world heritage sites using the potential to use these sites to develop a global culture of peace and collective responsibility for the protection of these heritage sites because we know as we know they belong to all peoples of the world they're not the the right of one play, one people to preserve them or destroy them as they see fit so we have that challenge um, we've seen some of that we also um, have experience of conservation and restoration of monuments um, both physical and virtual um, through our work with um, work with the aftermath of natural disasters here in Durham we have a UNESCO chair and a school who've been working in Nepal with the Nepali um, archaeologists um, in the re restoration and preservation of sites after the Nepal earthquake a couple of years ago and Durham University's archaeology department has actually been out there working with the rescue and archaeology departments in Nepal particularly in Kathmandu on the monuments that were damaged in Durbar Square looking at ways to rescue and learn insight from the destruction of the monuments and now actively working with the local communities on helping to restore those monuments and protect them in future um, areas. So perhaps some of the work we've done working with natural disasters could be applied to um, conflict zones as well. Um, but hopefully there's some ideas there for the future. So thank you very much again, Leila, for asking that question. Okay, I have to mention that I did miss Mr. Cunningham in uh, Berlin at an archaeology conference just last week. Um, it was a lovely meeting. We were talking about all kinds of things, including Kathmandu. He presented um, some really good stuff about the work there. Uh, but moving on to the next question, um, Jane. This is from another intern of ours from Malawi, Africa, Abel. Uh, Abel. His question is, does UNESCO have its officers or functionaries at each of the inscribed world heritage sites in the world? Are these officers nationals of the said country or people distant, distant from its culture and history? That should be an easy one to answer yeah. for you, I guess. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Abel, and a very useful question to know. And I'm sure it probably does vary from nation to nation. So I'm going to be talking about my experiences here in the United Kingdom. So here in the United Kingdom, most World Heritage Sites are managed actually on the ground, actually at the front line, by a partnership of the key stakeholders. As I said, here in Durham, that's the three major landowners, the university, the cathedral, and the local authority, the county council. And then at representatives of other advisory bodies, ICOMOS and Historic England here in the UK. Now, here in the UK, Historic England has the designated responsibility from UNESCO to ensure our compliance with the World Heritage Convention. Here in the UK, it passes from UNESCO through to the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, which is um, the central government body, then de delegated to Historic England to the regions to have responsibility for, main, for maintaining our uh, duties and monitoring our duties in the in individual World Heritage Sites. So, for example, here in uh, Durham, on our World Heritage Site Coordinating Committee, I have Barbara Hooper from the Newcastle Office of, um, of Historic England, who is our um, support and our watchdog and our advisor to make sure that we are working on, um, to the full um, honor of the UNESCO Convention. That then means that for us, the officers who um, carry out that responsibility are actually embedded in the local and regional community. And I'm confident that this delegation of responsibilities to stakeholders closer to the site ensures that better understanding of and engagement with our culture and history. Indeed, actually, they're really part of it. So that does help for us. So I think that's the example for how the model works here in the United Kingdom.
Sorry, um, Jane, sorry, um, I lost you a little bit. Uh, so our next question is from Alice Mini in Italy. Uh, she's also an intern from at Coenesco. And her question is about the resources designated to the cultural sector and the distribution among site maintenance and other cultural activities. Also, the percentage of GDP spent in this sector and how it is distributed. I believe the first part would be applicable to a site as well. But the second part would be applicable more to a country. Yes, um, certainly. And thank you very much, uh, Alice. That's quite a challenging question. And certainly from the site point of view, quite a difficult one for me to answer. Um, because, of course, the, res the resources that are invested in the World Heritage Site here at Durham are spread over a number of different institutions. So the cathedral has their own budget of which a proportion is spent on maintenance of the site and a proportion on their engagement activities. Uh, the same for the university and the same for the um, uh, county council. So it's actually quite difficult to get a handle and even more difficult because within that proportion, they would be hard pressed to say what proportion is actually directly related to the World Heritage Site and what proportion is uh, broader based work that they do across the site. So I perhaps will have to dodge a bit of that question, but perhaps move on to the broader national where I've got a little bit more information. We're very help, helped by the fact that Historic England produces each year a document called Heritage Counts, which gives us some statistics. That was one from 2014. This is the most recent one, Heritage and the Economy from Historic England, which provides some very useful breakdowns on um, the role of heritage in our national economy. Also, one I can recommend is the wider value of UNESCO to the UK, which is also produced by unesco.org.uk, which again, gives some of those insights. I've got a few figures here, and I hope some of them help with that question. It was quite a challenge to come get to grips with. But here in the UK, heritage tourism generates 16.4 billion pounds in spending by domestic and international visitors. So that is a, an important uh, figure, you know, not to, be, not to be sniffed at. I'd like some of that. Um, our own sector, again, the heritage sector, contributes £11.9 billion gross value added to the U UK economy. And if you include the indirect effects of our contribution, so people who come in and visit heritage sites also want to stay here, travel around, eat, spend their money, that contribution is 2% of the national gross va value added to the nation. And 2% is a, 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 an important part of our money. Now, <coughs> on the flip side of that, but also good, repair and maintenance of historic properties um, in the UK generated £9.6 billion pounds in construction sector in employment and output. So although it costs us money to maintain our sites, it's a virtuous circle because that money goes back into the construction industry economy. So, you know, there is a good side there. But what I perhaps like to do is just finally return, thinking of that question, and please do go and have a look at the figures. There's a lot of information in those documents. I can provide links to those to Ajay later on. But don't forget that a lot of our benefits are beyond putting into cash, into money. We can show that the importance of, uh, importance of participation in and enjoyment of heritage benefits well-being and quality of life as well. 
It improves people's perception of place. It develops their sense of place and belonging. How do you put a price on that? And I'd perhaps like to finish with a very nice um, document in Heritage Counts. Um, you probably, again, you won't be able to see the details, but it's a wonderful diagram which goes into the benefits of heritage. And I will just run round it. So we have things like money, regeneration and development, um, that historic environment actually makes places more valuable, uh, more, they generate more money. It also has money in generating tourism, but that also introduces people to our culture. It helps with education and skills, both learning about our heritage, but the skills to maintain it. The wonderful stonemasons that work on our World Heritage Site, who learn those skills and pass them on to apprentices, just like their medieval ancestors used to do. But those intangible things, it gives people a sense of place a sense of belonging, a sense of understanding and insight when they visit new places as well, that common ground to learn and to learn to cooperate. It helps with our personal development. It in improves our environment. These beautiful places make us feel better, lift our spirits. And overall, heritage improves our quality of life. Those things it's very difficult to put a cash, pounds and value on, but they are so vital to us. They are the things that, that enrich our lives and give us value and help us to engage with other people, to value other people and hopefully work mutually together and for each other's benefit. So perhaps I'd like to flip that question and say perhaps beyond the pounds, beyond the money, are the, those other wonderful values that uh, heritage brings to us. So uh, hopefully I've um, evaded your question a little bit there. I, I do apologize, um, Alice, but uh, hopefully I've given you something else to think about. So, um, Jean, we, we have a few more minutes, and I thought um, I take one of the questions which came in through the comments. Mm -hmm. um, this is a question by uh, Ms. Cecily from World Heritage Catalysis catalysis Norway and uh, she has a very technical question I don't know <laughs> if you can take um, I'll try. This in five minutes but I'll still, we'll still try she says the World Heritage and Sustainable Development Policy adopted in 2015 set out a number of considerations beyond protection of OUV how are you integrating a sustainable development perspective in the management of your site and how are you within the budget priority prioritizing efforts would you like uh, uh, me to read that again? Or? Um, I think we're okay. We're quite lucky that um, we have just produced our new World Heritage Site Management Plan. And so that means that because we actually produced it in 2017, we were able to um, it build into that the requirements for sustainability into our aspirations for our management system and so we actually require all of our key partners to um, sign up to that in their work on the world heritage supporting the world heritage site and actually in their considerations for projects to always build in a consideration of longer term sustainability into what they're doing it's one of the checklist items that they have to consider. So if we're doing a new development on, on site, um, longer term sustainability is in there. Funding, resourcing, and actually anticipating what those needs might be. Um, I'm not sure if that's detailed enough an answer. If you want, want to push me further, please, please do have a, a probe into Cecily's uh, question. Right, so I'll just repeat that one more time. Uh, the World Heritage and Sustainable Development Policy sets out a number of considerations beyond protection of OUV. How are you integrating a sustainable development perspective in the management of your site? And how are you, within the budget, prioritizing these efforts? Mm. <sighs> no, so I'd have to... Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I'd have to be honest and say I'd have to go away and think about that. In more detail, it's not something I could answer off the top of my head. I do apologise. That's all right. Um, so I think um, there's a, I mean, there's a small, well, a brief question. What are the youth initiatives? I think you've answered yes, this yeah. uh, already. Mm. Um, but the question 
one of our interns from Afghanistan had was what are the youth initiatives in UK and do they work globally as well? I guess he means mm. it in the context of heritage, heritage. and heritage yeah. engagement. Uh, uh, is mm. there something that you know of which works yeah. globally as well? Mm. Uh, the only ones I've had experience of um, in the UK have been UK based and the one particularly that we use that we work with here in Durham is the Young Heritage Ambassadors program which um, was actually developed by our colleagues at Blynavon World Heritage Site in Wales and they gained a um, grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund to develop a, um, a range of young groups of young people to become ambassadors for World Heritage to get involved um, and we certainly have one of those groups working with us they've been working with us now for two years in Durham and they take part in helping us to put together events um, giving a young person's perspective and take a lead in suggesting events and putting on activities that they're confident will appeal to young people and get them turned on to heritage um, I don't have any experience of any international programs. All right, um, that's okay. But um, I think we can end the live broadcast now, Jane. If you mm. can just click the red button and okay. um, that should be done. I think we've had a fantastic session. Uh, we had some uh, questions that uh, about our interns wanted to ask live. However, we didn't want to risk um, getting you out of the live mm. broadcast so we did not allow yeah. that to happen so that is why i had to interject and mm. keep um, asking questions on my own here but i think we've had a great session um and um, we'll end the live session now then Jane. okay i'll just switch off but just to say if there are any other questions that people would like to discuss with me offline i'd be very happy to pick those up by email or if Ajay, you want to feed something through i find it very stimulating and very challenging and important for me to see those questions so i will be working on cecilia's question when i get off air thank you very much indeed and thank you for the opportunity to speak to everybody